so hello everyone and um happy holidays um if your hanukkah is over i hope it was a good one if any of your holidays are still going on i hope they're good i'm kind of in my own little finish up rate your story world and get everybody's feedback back so i really don't know what day it is i'm lucky i made this um <laughs> And so today we're gonna we're doing this book by popular demand, and I hope you guys ask a lot of questions. The Star in the Christmas Play by Lynn Murray. You know, I like reading other people's books better than my own, but anyway. I wish I were any animal but a giraffe, said Raffi. Instead of running toward the Savannah school like usual, he dragged his hooves. When Rafi arrived at school, he joined the others in the audition line. I'm trying out for baby Jesus, said Lion Cub. He curled into a little ball. I'd love to be Mary, Meerkat practiced looking meek. I hope to be Joseph, said Cheetah, using a deep voice. I'm a shoe in for the camel, Camel arched his back. With a little fleece, I'll make a swell sheep, said baby Hippo. Mrs. Ostrich began the tryouts. Each animal acted out a scene. When Rafi's turn came, he read Joseph's part. Everyone applauded. Well done, said Mrs. Ostrich. That afternoon, Rafi raced home. I read so well, Mama, everyone clapped. Maybe someone as tall as I am can be a star. Mother smiled, you're my star. The next day, Raffi galloped so fast to school, he even beat Cheetah there. He couldn't wait to hear which part Mrs. Ostrich assigned to whom. One by one, Mrs. Ostrich read out the parts. Lion would play baby Jesus. Meerkat would be Mary and Cheetah Joseph. New and Camel both got to play camels. Raffi's lips twitched. Will I even get a part at all? Someone as tall as me could never be a, a star. He slouched. All from the aardvarks to the hyenas hooted and howled with joy as they received their parts, except Raffi, who wanted to kip, kick up dirt and run home. Then Mrs. Ostrich called his name. Raffi, I've not yet assigned your role, she began. Raffi bent down and whispered to her. I'm too tall, aren't I? Yes. I can't play a lead role because I don't fit in the manger. Yes. I can't play a manger animal because I'll block the others from view. Yes. I can't play an angel as I'll fall through the roof. She nodded. But don't worry, said Mrs. Ostrich. I'm sure we'll come up with something. She patted his long neck and paused. Raffi looked longingly at the stage and then up, up, up at the sky. He remembered his mother told him, you're my star. Then a thought came to him. He whispered in Mrs. Ostrich's ear. What a fine idea, she said. That's truly an important part. On Christmas Eve, all the Savannah babies took their places behind the curtain except Raffi, who hid behind the manger. The nativity play began. When the babe was born, a bright light rose above the manger. By the light of this guiding star, the wise men and shepherds found their way to the baby Jesus. Raffi beamed. After all, he was the star in the Christmas play. And I think what? that's the end. I love it. I love it so much. It always you makes me want to cry. Aww. Aww. Oh, so cute. It's so, oh, oh my God, that was so sweet. And I'm so glad, like he thought of it himself. I, I'm crying like I cook. Me too. I know, me too. I'm crying for other reasons too, but um, so. <laughs> What, why I like to share this story, because I have like a horrible childhood story where I was eight, which is too old for a picture book, but still, I was very, very tiny. Um, so I was in the nativity play and I was an angel along with my friend and we had all kinds of fun 
like, on, you know, waiting to go on stage and then on stage together and whatever. And we're in the play as angels. And then that Sunday night and the next day I'm in school in the third grade and my mother comes up to the school which is like, they're like, um, they called me out of class. They said, my mother was there, get my stuff. So when you're like eight years old, that's like just awful. So um, basically she said, my friend, ha- well, no, this was probably two days later. It was like two or three days later. So um, after the play. So basically she came in and said, my friend had died and that I was exposed Um, So I had to come home and I had to take this like medicine for meningitis. Mm. I know. So it's like a horrible story. But so I always wanted to write a story kind of like for her. But so I, you know, she died and then we were never in touch with her parents again. And so like there's really no one to know. But I where I started from was wanting to. um write a story for my friend Dorothea and then I was like oh my gosh like that's not a kid-friendly story in any way shape or form so then I'm like well what if like just the spirit of it you know about something with the nativity play and um so it kind of you know that's how like kind of the background framework came and then my favorite um animal nativity was always the camel and um I always put up the nativity in my my parents house so I wanted it to be a camel main character and then as the pieces were coming together like I just like realized like a camel could not be the main character you know, once I'm replacing kids because I want to get away from the death meningitis thing, right? And being sad and taken out of school and, you know, having to navigate or losing my friends and stuff, you know, right after a Christmas play, like Merry Christmas. Um, so anyway, so I, I, I was trying to do animals and then I'm like, I can't do a camel. Um, so then I was like, well, what could I do, you know? what could I do? And then I started to think of like, not like wanting to be in it and not wanting to be it and what kind of animals like couldn't be in it. And so of course I thought of like hippo and stuff and then like, but hippo could be like a cute sheep. And we also don't want to like, you know, fat shame or anything like that. So like, you know, because I hate to say it, you don't, you have to think of these things. Um, so, and, you know, and I didn't want it to be an elephant because that would feel like the same thing, although I love elephants. So, and plus they're kids too. So I'm like, it, I don't know if it would be too big or what, but then I came up with the giraffe and the giraffe was like perfect. And um, I really felt like the answer came to my friend because I'm like, so the giraffe wants to be the star, but how can I resolve this problem? And I really feel like this star came from my friend because we were angels in the play. And it came to me like he could be the star of Bethlehem. And I was like, chills, (laughs) you know? And I'm like, oh my God, like it's so, it's so perfect. Like it's it's like a gift, you know? Like it had to be a divine gift for it to, come together like that um and then I wrote it and of course it's like you know even when I was reading it, I was getting really emotional because I always think of my friend Dorothea and um I like put it away I'm like I'm not gonna do anything with this like my intention was there to write a story for my friend I did that um it's done whatever so then Beaming Books has or Spark has is their first annual um picture book contest and I'm like oh they like religious I said I really don't have anything that's like overtly religious and then I'm like but I do have my nativity play um story you know um I'm like maybe so I did some research I did a little bit of revising um to make it 
flow and bright and shiny. And um, I'm like, well, hey, that's what I got. And I think the deadline was December 31st. So I was like in the spirit and everything. And I just sent it out. And then in February, um, I got, I think it was a, an email that said, um, well, your story is not the winner because of, of our contest because we wanted to pick something that would be available um, year round, but we loved it so much that we're offering you a contract anyway, mm -hmm. which was the prize. Mm -hmm. So I got like, I didn't win it, but I got the same amount of money and I got a contract. So, and so then that's how this story came to be. But why it's an important story is like, we all come up with ideas that all come from someplace. It could be real life. Like you notice I didn't shove my friend Dorothy in there. I didn't even put her name in because I don't want to cry. You know, mm. it's hard. But anyway, um, so a lot of times, you know, despite where your idea comes from or whatever, you have to let the story go where it needs to go. Like, I don't even think I would have came up with the star if I, I didn't, you know, get away from what happened in real life and just try to let it be inspired by my friend and be what it has to be. And I think, like, especially judging from some of the stories that I see in Rate Your Story, we can tell that the story has a connection to the person's real life. Like, you could just tell. And you could tell that they're kind of forcing the story to be what they want it to be rather when, than what the story is. And I guess you could question who is in control of a story. But once you get like professional and objective, you realize a story comes from you, but then it takes on a life of its own if you let it. So this is just like my example of that. And I love this story. I'm proud of it. I think it's very sweet. I think it's accessible. I think it doesn't have to be just for Christians because um, the religion part is not really crammed down anybody's throat. Um, so I think that like other people could enjoy it, which is really important to me. Uh, does anybody know what the theme is? fitting in everybody has a place so well both of those and also self-acceptance and also mm -hmm. being your best you like if he didn't like really take some time to say you know I, I'm of value and I I, mm -hmm. I have a role to play what is it how can what can I do like mm -hmm. instead of his um his tallness being a flaw, it became a strength. No one else could have played the star. So it's kind of like be you and shine also, you know, sh shine bright, shine, shine, shine bright as yourself, like just be you. Cause basically that's all he was with himself with the star, <laughs> right? And it was very important. I and plus I love the pun though that he ended up being the star. I love sure. the way and the star plays in with the mother. And I like the way the mother gives him the, you know, I mean, he's thinking about what she said, but she wasn't driving the story. Right. She kind of just made mm -hmm. that suggestion. And you and I have talked about that on story. Good point. Yeah, so that's a little tough. So so this is <clears> like, <throat> I would say this is a little bit geared younger likes like hedgehog and hedgehog's 100th day of school it's okay for an adult um to impart wisdom but they can't solve the problem mm -hmm. you know so i think it's clear that you know what she said inspired mm -hmm. but he did all the work himself right yeah well anyway i was blathering on and on and on <laughs> about my backstory <laughs> Um, so does anyone have any questions? I do. Yay. <laughs> I'm not trying to make you sad, but do you, do you talk about the backstory at all when you 
talk okay I, I I didn't think so obviously I was just wondering if you no um you know I kind of feel among friends with you guys like you know it's hard like I don't know it's one of those things that you can still remember how it feels like mm-hmm. even when you're older so it's tough but yeah no not so much um but, you know, we're an intimate group. And I also, you know, a lot of you guys are with me and Rate Your Story too. I, I really, and people will be watching this from Rate Your Story. So that's okay, you know, because I'm doing in this closed circle. I don't care who watches it after. But it's important to see that we can feel very passionate from something and have a connection to something and start out in a place with our stories. But that, that we have to, again, let it go to be what it has to be. So I'm, I'm kind of happy to share that, you know, obviously there was no way I was going to do that. I know there's books about death, but um, a, ch- a child, um, you know, a child dying, right? Be- it was actually right before Christmas because Christmas came after. Um, so it was like the week before Christmas, our pageant was like the weekend before. And this is like right before Christmas Eve. Um, you know, but everything has an origin. It doesn't mean that we have to write about it. And if we do write about it, to be honest, we have to be able to read it, keep our shit together. (laughs) I mean, I, I think it's for some people to write those books. It's not for me, you know, but I do, I have to say, it's always going to be special to me, um, that I know where it came from and and I feel like the the people the people we do these kind of things for that are no longer with us that they that they feel it somehow so um I'm I really do love this book I have a question yes the process question Mm -hmm. so you said you you took it out when you entered the Beamy Books contest how long did it take you to write this approximately from beginning to end and then how long did it take between signing the contract and getting it out um so this one I think went really fast from I'm trying to remember no it might have been the next year it might have been 2018 so I wish I could tell you the dates and I would look them up however my my I have a Mac now and my PC crashed and it's um I haven't recovered off the disk drive yet because I have to buy a drive and they charge you five hundred dollars and you know it's one thing after another like if my brakes my air conditioner Uh, like approximately just approximately how long did it take Um, you to write it and how long did it take one I, I had to have written this like between 2000 2010 probably probably closer to 2010 and um you know ever so what you know to be honest I think I would take it out at Christmas and work on it a little bit mm-hmm. like Lisa knows in our critique group I did that with which is Christmas switchmas too it was like we our critique group meeting was before um, Halloween, so I'm like, let me drag out which is Christmas Switchmas, and I worked on it, and I've worked on it again in the second critique group that was after Thanksgiving. But I have to tell you, I'll do the revisions, and then I will um, probably let it sit and forget about it, and bring it out next Christmas. <laughs> So, so this was know. over. So I guess what am I going? So this was over several Christmases that it finally came to light, and you used it in the contest. So this wasn't. So it wasn't. It was a. Um, took a while, and then and then your process once you signed the contract took how long? Once I signed the contract, I would say. So I, I know they called me in like February, and then I probably signed the contract in April, and I think it came out like next like august or something did the editor have a lot of no 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 i came out next it might have been september what did the editor have a lot of revisions or changes for you to do or no but um 
I'm not going to be cocky about that because I had a <laughs> lot of revisions on Palace Rat the other day. So, mm. no, in fact, my first, this is my third book. My first three books, I didn't get a lot of revisions. It's just, it's so clean and great language. I love it. Thank you. Um, Moldy Locks, I got some casket references cut out. Um, casket art notes and references cut out. Um, I would say, except for that, Moldy Locks didn't have a lot of tweaks either. Um, I did pretty good. Palace Rat, which is, I don't know, my eighth or ninth or whatever it is, um, Palace Rat like had the most. Oh, and my son was like, when did you write that? 1998? And I'm like, yes. Because <laughs> we went to France. That's why he said that. And then I'm like, don't you remember? And he's like, they, because a rat um, went across the courtyard in Versailles. And I was like, what if that was like a rat who's actually related to rats that lived here when um, King Louis XIV <laughs> lived here? Mm -hmm. And then I was like, and what if the rat it was related to was his pet? Because, you know, you know, in those days, people had like giraffes and all kinds of weird pets, alligators and giraffes and stuff. So I was like, what if? And then I'm like, and what if he he was pampered? And what if everybody hated him and then they tried to kill him? <laughs> And I worked that in. Um, and then he goes to Avignon, which is the this, this seat of the French uh, Pope, which is a beautiful place. And I was like, what if he escaped, you know, go to God or whatever? What if he escaped to Avignon? And then he was like, the, the, the stark contrast to the sunflowers and the lavender from like that, that palace Versailles was like amazing until I went to Russia. But anyway, um, it, it's just amazing and opulent. And I was like, what if he was like all like hoity-toity and had to get <laughs> along with these country mice that lived in Avignon? And um, so it became this like iteration of city mouse, country mouse, kind mm -hmm. of. Anyway, we got off. But <laughs> so that was another one that um, I dragged out, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> I dragged out and I said, this person's looking for stuff with culture. And honestly, I'm not proud of this. Okay. But it wasn't my like best marketing. It was like, you know what? I'm, I'm tired of like marketing and sometimes it doesn't work. So they want culture. Here's culture. Whack. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I got a, I got an email and I was like, what? really I was like I don't know I don't see them taking French so but they you know so but it's working out so that's good um but anyway so back to the process Can I ask another question oh yeah finish the process question oh just the process and I say this and everybody looks at me funny but I am a big supporter of letting things sit until their time, like when something calls to drag them out and get them ready, because sometimes you cannot force this path, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, pretty much all of my, my, um, my wins are something that I dragged out because of something like even, um, moldy Lux, that was a dinosaur critique. And she's like, I love this, but I don't, you know, I have 10 other dinosaur books. What do you got? So I, that was like a favorite in my mind. So I like dragged, I said, oh, I have this, the fractured fairy tale, um, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, but with zombies, it's called Moldilocks and the Three Scares. And she's like, oh, that sounds neat. Send that to me. So I didn't say like, I didn't get her for a critique or even go to that conference saying, oh, Moldilocks is my goal. Right. I, I like basically dragged that out when she's like, you know, I'm looking something for unusual or whatever. What do you got? And I'm like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So Maria, I have a question um, on your rat story. Is that third person, first person? Is there, are they talking rats or is it just third person? So that's interesting. <laughs> so basically um, the rat does talk to the king, but I do think he was a little crazy. Um, nobody, I basically tell people not to have that happen, but so it's, I think it's the way you do it. So I start the story out that um, Henri lived in a big castle and he had this, that, the other thing. He was the pampered pet of King Louis the 14th. And I set that up and, and like, that's kind of crazy to have a rat as a pet and dress it in like the same clothes that you wear and stuff. So um, I think that was okay. And I hadn't had him ever directly talk to the king in the original, right? He only talked to the mice when he came across them because they're mice and rats. Of course, they're gonna, they're gonna converse. Um, but part of my revision, and I don't know if they're gonna accept it, so I'll, I'll keep you guys posted. Um, but part of my revision, they wanted his storytelling to be woven in more. So I had him telling the, um, the king's stories so that he would fall asleep. So they could cut it, we'll see. I mean, it was experiment, but basically everything that they told, they told me in my letter, like it sounded like that's what I needed to do is bring in the storytelling earlier. If, if, if he starts storytelling when he meets the mice, like how else would you bring it start earlier unless he's story told to the king, right? So I don't know, we'll see. And I'm happy to tell you because if you guys could learn anything from my crazy journey, um, you know, that's great. And, you know, your journeys are not all going to be so linear as you think either. So that there's a lesson in that, right? Um, I call it the long and winding road, but basically it's third person and um, Henri like writes letters to the king. Oh, that was the other reason I thought I was able to get away with it. He writes letters to the king as, oh. th as though the king's gonna understand. So I felt like I had like license for him to speak to him and tell him stories. Um, and they also one that they were concerned about why he would leave the king and what was there in Avignon. So um, I put in this plot point where it occurs to him that, well, it occurs to him that he loves to tell stories more than anything in life. And what he tells is stories of palace life. But when he used to do it for the king, the king shortly fell asleep. And here he had all this audience that hung on his every word. So. I hope it works. Well, I guess we'll say, but third person definitely with a little liberty. But but again, it's like my eighth book or so. So I tell people this: it's a really hard thing to break the rules when you're first starting out, like especially in your first book. You have to really show that you can write within, not even show. I think that part of the learning curve is to learn to write within the rules. Like that's like the, the background and the foundation to learning to write. Even if it's just to prove it to yourself, like you have to master that before you can get creative and it, it, it works, if that makes sense. Go ahead. Hey, Mark, Marketing question. Um, so back to Starling Christmas Light. I love this book. Um, Thank you. So um, I know that sometimes you have to do your own marketing and sometimes the publisher does the marketing. What happened with the marketing of this book and, and what did you do to and what did they do? And So they were pretty, Beaming Books is pretty helpful. I did meet with their marketing department um, we, they did give me sheets to fill out about what I would do, um, what they would do. They, they do social media. Um, they did um, like a nativity script for like oh. you 
you can make puppets or you could do it. You could do it in your Bible, you know, your, your Sunday school or your church or whatever. Um, so there's a script for my other book. They did a recipe sheet to hand out. I mean, oh, I would. Eat. What? Let's, oh, let's eat. Yeah. Right. I wouldn't say yeah. that they were like overwhelmingly helpful, but I was having a lot of trouble with my child at that time. So I don't feel like I did as much as I could have. And, you know, who even knows? I know what the, the person in publicity and marketing, I think, was went out on maternity leave. So um, did you do school visits? So for this, I did like. I didn't really do school visits. I did like Girl Scout visits and small groups like that. Mm -hmm. no, nothing really, um, nothing really major. Does this book sell all year or just around Christmas? Well, that's a really good question because I, I think it's fine if you guys want to do a holiday book. It will sell well during the holiday, but then the sales like peter off for like the whole year. Um, and yeah, this book, it's always up on their website, but I don't feel like I get much sales. Although I did a Christmas in July push and, and it, it did, it seems like it did sell a little bit under that. But, you know, that, that's nothing major. So the thing about expectations, so Hedgehog goes to kindergarten, basically back to school book. Hedgehog's 100th day of school, basically 100th day of school book, January, February. This basically a Christmas book, Moldy Lax, even though I tried, I really tried. Basically a Halloween book, even though it's nothing about Halloween. Um, American Pie <laughs> for the July. So obviously I can't control myself. Um, my, my only book that has like longevity is Let's Eat so far. But then the Three Little Pigs and the Rocket Project, um, that could be all year round. But of course it does have a, like a science fair possible tie-in, but I, I feel like it might do better like in a more level playing field because there's no clear, clear, like not everyone's like, oh, science fairs are in February. I'm only going to buy this book in February or whatever. Um, but yeah, so you have to be aware if you do a holiday book that you, you could do well during the holiday. But after that, you're not going to be able to count on anything, you know. So I, I think it would be perfect to supplement these books that I have with like a book about dancing or dinosaurs. <laughs> because you do, you know, to be honest, if you're in it for the long haul, you do want something that you can sell all year. And I've done a lot of festivals and I brought this. Um, it does, it does like decent if it's by Christmas, but if it's not like whatever the closest holiday is usually does the best. If it's back to school, then Hedgehog goes to kindergarten, you know, so, so you get it. How well, did it, I'm what? sorry. No, go How ahead. well did it sell overall? Um, to be honest, as long as it sells out, I don't really track that. I've always had like, enough books coming out like they come out fast like Dia and my book um American Pie it's coming out in four months wow. so, so like you're busy and and like so I'm not like really tracking my old books although you see me promote you know keep them circulating like I'm juggling right as I'm juggling and keeping those books out there I'm working on American Pie with Dia, but I'm not like really focusing, to be honest, that, you know, I'm just like, I cash my check and that's it. Mm -hmm. I don't even look at, oh, how many returns or how many this or, I don't know why. I hate numbers, maybe that's why. I really do. So I think that all my books did like well enough, 
my, my first two kindergarten books sold out and they're probably not going to uh, redo them. And they had ebooks and everything else too, um, because of the different illustrators. I couldn't find them. I tried to get the hedgehog. Well, they were, they, they were mostly at Scholastic, but they did really, really, really well. Um, and something about that, I had like three more books in the pike, but by the time the second one published, I had been through nine editors at Scholastic. So um, by that point, like when I said, oh, there was others they were going to do, they were like, ah, yeah, no, probably not so much, you know, kind of. But that happens. Like the person who had lined them up to do is like gone like nine, eight people ago. Mm. You know? And even while the last one was being published, I had three editors. And that happened with Moldy Lux at Meredith. Um, Meredith was the one that bought Moldy Lux and then she was gone. And then I had two editors after her before Moldy Lux came out in the year and a half. So that happens too. So, so, you know, and then now these past two years, the pandemic, um, my books came out. Well, so let's eat would be a good example. I think of your question. So let's eat is not sold out yet. It's close, but I, I, I market let's eat all the time. Um, so it's close, but it has not sold out. The pandemic is a big factor of that. Also that it shelved in Bar Barnes and Noble in under cookbooks, which it's not. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for cookbooks and you pull it out, you're gonna be like, no, this is not what I want. If you, if you want it because you just want a culture book and you're looking around, you're not gonna find it and see it. So it's a, that one's a little bit of a tough sell. Is there anything you can do um, when that happens with your book, like with Barnes and Noble? Um, I don't know. I think I got it in the, all I did was like really not worry about Barnes and Noble and what they did, you know, beaming books. You'll see them promote it from time to time. I have just increased my promotion of it and um, just different offers like I give consultations, um, you can get a consultation in a book. So an hour consultation in a book is like 35, I think. Um, and, and I sell them also that way. Mm -hmm. I just wanna make it sell out. <laughs> but it was really close. I mean, and for the pandemic, that was not bad because this came out, November 2019 and Moldy Locks did super well and I did super promotion and I asked them please don't make it come out in November please because Moldy Locks basically was going to die uh, um, November 1st right and this came out November 6th I think it was and I was like no don't don't, don't even, I had such a rough personal year and I was exhausted from moldy locks, like just don't. And they're like, nope, that's the date. So I was like, okay, well, you know, I, it's probably gonna suffer because of that. I said in my head and, you know, so I did what I, I could from home. And then, so that's like November, December, January, February. So five months later, the pandemic hit. March 13th, because my travel business got hit right away. That's why I know it was March 13th. Um, and then like, you know, it just, all my visits canceled, which I would have like, Let's Eat was my book that I could, the one that I could plug all year round, right? So that was like unfortunate because that that would have done good with the school visits you know culture and what other kids are doing like social studies culture um just and it's just a needed book like we all have to understand we're all different but we we're all people with hearts so it it's a good book for that but again you know and i have not gone back to school visits 
yet. I was thinking about it and now I, I just read something. So I'm like, I don't know. But yeah, so, so, you know, I think the takeaway, I know I'm blathering on and on. The takeaway value for that though, is that um, you, have to, you have to keep selling your book. You have to do it. Um, despite what they're doing or not doing, you have to sell your own book. I mean, and you can be as much focused on the numbers as you want or as you can be. I'm awful with statements and contracts. I used to work in a law office and ever since I stopped, I don't want to, I don't want to read contracts. I don't want to do numbers. I just want to write picture books that have heart or humor or whatever. So, you know, but so but you could pick your own path, but you definitely whether you're going to focus on numbers or not, you have to work it. And your job is not done once you sell that book. So that's, mm -hmm. that's something important to um, realize. And that's why, kind of why I wanted to do this too. For those of you who came in late, um, we did this because you will get asked questions in your little visits or your webinars, and you have to be able to think quick. You have to be able to talk in front of people without getting nervous. Um, did someone raise their hand? No, I think that, I just moved, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so, you know, just you guys being in here and talking in front of everybody is good practice for you. With that in mind, does anybody else want to talk except for me since we got, did one <laughs> book the whole night? Oh, do I? I would like to not ask a question, but point some things out. Oh, sure. Of what, because now, you know, all the, so many things that come into rate your story. Yes, please are, are, do. Are missing what this book has. Because right away, like I felt for Raffi, like immediately there was a connection because it had the child centered focus. That's a good point. It? Yeah, like so many things come in aren't really kid relatable. So many manuscripts where this one is like dead on. Like you could feel for him, you know, you could, it was a something that a kid could relate to. He was very childlike, you know, it was, that was just something I observed when you were reading it. Thank you. Yeah, well, and also he's kind of, there's another like other crest level that is kind of based on Kevin as a kid. Oh, and I, I do have a question. Okay. When you had the baby lion want to be baby Jesus, was that like a nod to C.S. Lewis? <laughs> I did or read did that book and I did think about it, but it, it no, you know, no. What that, <laughs> well, I thought of that, but no, it was because he's the king of kings. Yeah. Was more was more of like the real Oh, reason. like the king of the jungle kind of thing. Yes. The king yeah, of okay. King, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the king of the jungle. So I, that that was more like the direct, like, but I did think that, but th this was my driving thing was the king of kings. I thought how cute mm -hmm. if the, the king of the jungle got to be the king of the king. King of kings. <laughs> Very cute. Well, I wonder if that was what C. S. Lewis was going for with Anne Swin. You know what? I thought that for sure when I read it. Yeah. There was a lot of nods to that. So that's the other thing. Like, um, there's all different levels that your story needs to have, too. Um, and, that, and that's why you don't want to pigeonhole. Like, it's only about this, like, it does have to be about one thing, but it doesn't have to be, like, how it came out of your head. And I say this a lot, how Athena came out of Zeus's head fully formed. Like stories don't usually come out like that. They have to take twists and turns and evolve and shape and grow. And you could take bits of different experiences. Like, you know, when he was dejected, my son has mild cerebral palsy and that was like upsetting. Like he would get disappointments like Rafi got so even though it's not the same, mm -hmm. it's universal. Like a kid wants to be like other kids. So I have to say, if I had to say that, I 
drew something um, for that character would be from that. Well, and that's what gives the story heart. Mm -hmm. Right? Right, right. When it's something universal. And I did set it. It didn't really, like, well, we can look at it. Um, so, you know, it's a hard call when you're writing a picture book, like how to start it. But I recommend The Ordinary World, The Ordinary World with a Crack in It or Inciting Sun. That mm -hmm. first picture, oh. No. I, I know, right? She, oh. like, nailed it. So cute. So, Your artwork is perfect. I know. Well, oh my gosh, that was a whole thing. She was an illustrator for my second book. And I put a call out on Facebook. Um, friends, show me your, your Savannah animals. And she put a lion that I was like, oh my God. And then I'm like, why didn't I think of her? She was the, the illustrator of my last book. And then I was like, it has to be it has to be her. So I sent her in. I'm like, she's basically my only pick. So um, then I didn't hear what happened. And I was at the bank and she called me from the UK. She's like, they offered me the contract, but my agent didn't get back to them in time. So they took it away because they do three weeks vacation. So I, so I got on the phone with my editor. She got on the phone and, and I begged and I pleaded and I'm like, just tell them it was a mistake. Tell them that you can't punish my illustrator because of this. She was perfect. I really want her, blah, 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 blah. And then there was like quiet. And then she, she called me again and was like, I got it back. So that was fun. But um, so wh what would you say I, how did I start this? Ordinary world, ordinary world with a crack in it or inciting event? Ordinary world with a crack? Yep. Good job. It would be in the crack, and the crack would be he wishes he was any other animal but a giraffe. Well, the crack is kind of like, well, kind of yes, but also the crack is like instead of running toward the savannah school like usual, mm, he dragged his hooves. So I was trying to create intrigue here that you don't know why. Mm. So, but, but, so we answer this question. Do you think a kid can connect with want, wanting to be something else other than what you are? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Right. So I thought. Someone else. What? You know, I, or someone else. Right. You know, like, yeah. One of your friends does it all bigger and better. And exactly. So I felt like I got the emotion. Like, I thought this was. It's funny how you talk about your own work. You probably sound funny, but not all my work comes out fully formed. So I don't love it all. But this I thought was kind of, kind of, um, what word do I want to use? Um, ingenious. No, I'm being funny. Um, <laughs> it just was like this, you know, when you, you, when you just, I'm like, this is it because right away you cannot, because even as an adult, I'd be like, I, sometimes I wish I was anyone but myself because my life has not been easy. Right. And even as a kid, you identify with, so I feel like I got everybody covered that right away, you're going to connect with that statement. And then you're going to be like, why? Right. Turn the page. Right. So, and then I tell. And, and so it's a body image thing. So people are going to, kids are going to connect with that, right? Yeah. Just being different from the norm is such a struggle in school that um, you can really connect with this as a kid. Right. So, you know, part of me was like, oh, maybe I should have not made it Christian so that but it is what it is. It came out the way it came out and thank yeah. God it sold. But, you know, Lynn, I, to talk about, to talk about just about like the crack in the normal world. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm, I mean, I know what a story looks like setting up in the norm, not, you know, the character's normal world. So would a crack be something opposite of what a character normally does? It could be. Um, a crack is kind of like, a little nod or a little sign that something's changing. 
Oh, okay. So in this, it's just kind of simple. I'm not saying it's the best crack in the ordinary world. Mm -hmm. I thought my emotional connecting right away up front was the good part. The next part, um, it does show a crack. It's it's not the best one, but um, I, I don't know. I just can't, for some reason, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but next year, I think, I don't, that whole closet is filled with picture books and my garage. I, I think we're just going to pull them and just read beginnings and mm -hmm. just say, what kind of beginning does this have? Mm -hmm. um, and again, I tell people this, people look at me like, oh, really? Like, not going to do that. But you know what your story is to some degree. Just write 15 to 20 different beginnings that kind of lead toward what you're doing and pick the best one. Don't be like, oh, this is how it came out. You know, w what is going to be the most hook, the biggest hook? Like, I feel like, I feel like, I, I, kn I know that they were connecting at Beaming, well, it was Spark House, but it switched to Beaming Books. I was one of their first books. Um, I could see them connecting to this. Not all my beginnings had such an immediate connection. So you have to really try to get the best one. It doesn't always come out right right away your first thing it doesn't you know sometimes it's revision but like really try and dig deeper if that makes sense but but for me um I could say that's like the best the best way um sometimes I'll do all three like as part of my like 10 15 ideas of how I'm gonna open the door to the story and that might help you too think of it as opening a door and inviting someone in I can tell you most of the people that rate your story do not look at it like that because the beginnings are rough. You know, the beginnings are, are rough and a kid has to be like, okay, I'm connecting with this main character or this problem and I'm going to follow this character through and I'm going to root for them. If that makes sense. I mean, I so think it help with, go sorry. ahead. No, I was going to tie that in, but what about the title? Does it tie in if you start with a title and know where you want to go with it? Or do you do the title later? And I know you've always said, you know, just like starting the story with writing it different ways, you know, come up with a list of titles. So does it, I mean, how did this, this one come about? Did you get the title before the story or the story before the title? Well, so it was going to be the angels in the Christmas play, obviously, and I had to get away from that. So then I was like, okay, the star, but I honestly wasn't thinking the star of Bethlehem. And of course, it's very natural for everyone want to be the star. Mm -hmm. And I, I could tell you there was a point that I really didn't know if it was going to be the baby Jesus or Mary or Joseph, I knew I wanted to avoid angels for obvious, you know, being an angel in the play, but you know, like that, that was my original door in was the angels in the play or whatever, whatever kind of diluted concept I had there. And then I was like, no, no, no. So that, so then it was the star, but what did the star mean? I wasn't sure. <laughs> So it was a process, but when I got that the title, the star in the Christmas plate, I did like it, you know, because what does everybody want to be? Do you want to be the understudy? <laughs> no. So I was like, so that could be a hook. And plus star is such a good word. Christmas is a hook. And I took out, so when I, when I tell you guys that I took out books, um, for this, I took out every book I could with the giraffe main, char main character, every book I could find on um, body, body image, on self-acceptance, on Christmas, even if it wasn't related, and every book, especially on nativity plays. And I read all of them, and, and there, there were like 
this was at least close to 100 with all those things together. And um, my book was not like any of them. So I knew, like I, I really knew um, why I didn't pursue it like with anyone else to the contest. Well, cause it's like, for me, stories and ideas are like butterflies and would you know oh, I have this idea let me go write this story and I just move along and oh this one's shiny and glittery let me put my focus on that one or oh it's Halloween let me do which is Christmas switchmas um you know so yeah so so I I flit around a lot but but I have to say I did think that this was like viable well, so any other questions before we go? This has been the longest thing on one book, but some at least questions I've been blathering and blathering. Oh, it's really good though. It, it has been good. It's really Very good. good. Yeah. Thank you. Well, my Christmas or whatever holiday you celebrate wish for you guys is that one day that you can be here and blather on about your book. <laughs> thank you but yeah so do the work though but keep reading I mean you guys are in the right place by studying books and really seeing why someone I mean it was Judy I think said oh you know I could see that this book does things that not in you know other stories that we get to read so always be asking yourself, what draws me to this book? What connects me? What would what would connect a kid? What's the takeaway value? So what's the takeaway value of this book? Anybody? I have a place. You know, I'm fine. I'm, I'm fine who I am. I have a place. Mm -hmm. And find your place. Find your star. Mm -hmm. be, be a star. You know. I love that. Mm -hmm. That's another thing. You know, we see entire stories that really don't have a theme. Mm. They yeah, you get to, you'll get to the end of it and you're like, what was this about? <laughs> like, or how would a kid relate to this? You know, it's, um, yeah. But those are all important things to remember. Yeah, and we are going to have some nice little webinars we have planned at Read Your Story Me and Judy and our team. We're all working on these things to help you guys like this year to really realize what you need to focus on. And one of the main things is not being defensive over your ideas. Listen, our word for 2022 is going to be professionalism, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so so some of you got to see my revision letter for Palace Rat, and I didn't cry. <laughs> no, you didn't. No. <laughs> there was there was a lot in that letter. I know, and I was like, no, well, you know what? I'm glad they have faith in me that I could do two pages or whatever this is. <laughs> and like, yeah. and like by Monday, <laughs> by like, Monday. What? You know what I, I like? Uh, what did I read? Like, was very much. I read something. I don't remember what it was. But it it was very similar. I don't know. It could play with what you're talking about about me being professional, about feedback is like how a tree grows. And if a tree and if there's no wind, you know, when the first wind comes, the tree will fall over. But it's got to have that wind in order to strengthen the trunk. Yes, and the, the resistance in order to make it. Well, that's yes. Good. That's a really great analogy. I hope a lot of people watch this because it, that has a lot of takeaway, but we're going to just focus on that a lot because you really have to be able to do what you have to do. And honestly, with mine, I felt like she did, she did make me dig a little deeper and I do think it's better. Like, honestly, mm -hmm. um, my problem was that it was already 675 words, but <laughs> How many words was this? Of uh, this? Hmm. Yeah. Probably close to 600. I'm a little bit like. Okay. That's right. I just wanted, I was curious. It didn't, it didn't seem like that. It, though. Yeah. It didn't read that long at all. Mm -mm. 
Well, in fact, I, the other thing I was picking up is, you know, how nice and concise all the sentences are, you know, how that's another common thing where you'll get the people doing like really, really, really long yeah, sentences. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I was noticing oh. that in this, like how nice and con concise everything was. That is something that I focused on because I wanted the images to be crisp, mm -hmm. the image within a sentence and clear and make an impact on the kid, you know, mm -hmm. and like... um. So there's just before we go, wait, where's one? Oops, I skipped it. I think oh, these I wanted to be short and snappy, mm -hmm. but it was, there was a lot of, ah, there it is. Here I tried to make them as the images tight. Like there, uh, these I revised a lot. I can't be an angel as I'll fall through the roof. Like that was not the first way I said that. I was like, Aww. you know, I, I just Lynn, tried to make it so the images were, were clear. Um, Mona, did I hear Lynn, you? What do you think is your, what do you think is your, um, the area of your writing that you think is the strongest and that you probably need um, more, support or do you think you've been writing long enough that you feel fairly comfortable um with where you are like i have such a problem with plot plotting um where you know how do you feel about where you are with your writing after all these years so i like that question and i'm so glad that you asked it um because there's something we're going to address like in the rate your story webinars that you don't ever stop learning and like even going over plot or going over theme or going over beginnings you never really outgrow that like there's always reapproach and reminder and things like that um so i feel like i'm kind of like you guys like i get so much out of the book chat hearing what you guys say able to share with you sometimes when i share with you i remind myself <laughs> i'm like oh i knew that but it was buried but you guys like brought it out of me and i'm like oh yeah you know that would help me with this story that i'm working on that i'm like beating my head against the wall um so what am i hmm each story is different it's kind of like a pregnancy like they're all and, and a child like they're all different they all have different concerns um some of you heard the story before but i have this um galaxy school book that and you know i'm a pretty good writer what i say is being a good writer in a subway ticket will get you a ride on the subway because it's about storytelling more than writing and I came up with this format on this um, galaxy school that was really funny and walked right into puns about the planets and stuff. But once I introduced all the planets, like the story stopped because of this long in the tooth strict structure that I had set up. So I was like, I don't know what to do with this. We were in like a book chat or something and there was like nobody there. So we were all sharing our stories and somehow it came up and I shared that one and and Judy says why don't you take that out and put it in the back matter like as little recaps of the planets and I was like oh my god I was like you've just unlocked the whole story and basically I lost my story because that was <laughs> all the stuff that was in there but it was okay because like once I get out of that format like I was like okay now we can do this this and this I I had this very constrictive format that was funny and good but then like after you introduce them it just it was hard for it to go anywhere so you know and and Judy has not published yet although I do believe she's imminent um so we can you never stop learning you never start growing i couldn't necessarily put my finger on one thing it's just i think i have to keep reminding myself of of the the guidelines and the picture book conventions and how how a structure makes things stronger and just be a be objective and see, you know, be open to finding out what a story needs. Like, um, 
with the galaxy school, I wasn't like, oh, Judy, you haven't even been published. Like, I'm not even going to listen to you. <laughs> really? Oh, go away. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, whatever, Ju- Judy, you know. <laughs> Um, No, I was like, oh my God, like you take feedback for, for how it's given, you know, in the spirit it's given and for what it's worth. And let me tell you that, that feedback was like a key that opened the door. I'm like, (laughs) my whole story came out. Yay. And, and it's a pretty promising story too. So um, you have to do that. So I know this isn't so much about me because I feel like I could be objective. I don't know. I, I wish I could say it was one thing, but I think it's like everybody. It changes with each story and mm-hmm. you have to learn the lesson that you need to learn about that story. Um, what, in one, I could just give a quick example and then I'll try to let us go. Um, Ari's Orchestra, I wrote, it was my first story that got me into highlights for children Chautauqua in like 2000. Okay. And I took it out the other day and I'm like, (laughs) and it's really short and fast now and snappy. You have to give up whatever you need to give up to make the the story float. So I guess now that I'm thinking about if I had to say that, I I would say that it would be like letting go of, of stuff you know, not even necessarily about taking feedback because, you know, I always get, oh, you're such a good writer. And uh, that's nice. Doesn't sell my story. So I have to be the one to be able to be objective and look at it and know what to get rid of. Because to be honest, I think I'm at kind of like a level that people are not as harsh on my work as they need to be. Mm. So is that a better answer? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe that'll help you. Like maybe despite how much you've learned, um, I think you need to be harsh with, with your work and, and very objective. Um, so funny, rate your story, uh, story before we go. We have gotten notes from people saying that they're not going to take our feedback. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's oh, moot. Yeah. Right, because yeah. it's moot. moot. And like, these are people like, not gonna, not gonna go very far. And these people have said, well, you know, I am in 12 by 12 and I have gotten this critique professionally and I, this, that, the other thing. And we'd like, okay, and here you have some good feedback that'll get you, elevate you past all that. But if you're not gonna listen, we can't make you listen. You know, and we do pull when anyone says they don't want someone's feedback or like, I don't want this judge. They may not even say anything bad about them. We'll pull their story. We'll pull the feedback. We'll pull judges feedback to other people. We check and make sure like if we saw anything wrong, we would give them another reading, but we don't because they got good feedback, but they're not receptive. They just want the pop moments. They don't want a good story. Exactly, they're ratings shoppers. We started calling them. Um, it's like it's like I don't know. Like it's just let's just I cannot imagine that because that's to me like driving <laughs> driving a car and you crash into a medium, okay? <laughs> and someone gives you feedback for driving properly, so you don't crash into the medium. Are you just gonna keep driving and crashing into the medium? <laughs> well, Judy, are, are you able to quickly sh- tell your story oh, about Jenna? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so my daughter was um, at the Lyme Academy of Fine Art in Connecticut for three years, and they had comp classes where they would critique each other's artwork. And she was here over Thanksgiving, and I was talking about how, you know, we get some of these people who really are not very nice in responses to things and bellyache because they don't like what they heard or this or that. And I said, well, I guess you know what that's like because you were in three years of these comp classes and she says well we didn't do that in a comp class nobody complained or got upset about their feedback they just worked with it and I said oh well you know that doesn't happen here so much and she goes well (laughs) my daughter's very black and white about things she's just well that's the difference between being an amateur and being a professional 
Wow. Good for her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that resonate though? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So even so if you don't like it, you try it. Like, do you think that uh, like it didn't ruin me, but I got two pages of feedback on the palette shot. That was a lot. There was a lot. That was a lot. <laughs> that was a, and it was box. It was huge. But, you know, it really wasn't as much because I highlighted the, the things that actually it was a lot of her blathering about, <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, and I don't mind sharing it in, in another session, but we have to close this. But um. I was just like, well, I, I said, like, whatever she says, I'm going to try it. That was my attitude. Whatever she says, I am going to try it. I, I made another draft. I'm not losing anything. Mm -hmm. I'm like, and I highlighted everything that was actually specific to making a change or, or a suggestion. And I'm like, I'm doing all of this. And, and I spent like the whole long morning just going over different ways. And I opened up another document and was like, I could do it this way. I could do it this way. And I'm like, hmm, this works. Put that in, you know, and, and I, that was my attitude. I didn't go, she doesn't understand my story. She's not the reader for my story. This is not the publisher for my story. I don't want to publish with them if they don't understand my vision. <laughs> said none of these things. I said, I'm going to, focus on this and I'm going to do whatever they suggest to the best of my ability. And then I'm going to read it through and see if it makes it better. And guess what? It made it better. <laughs> Yay. It did. It, it made me dig into the character a little bit more, but you know what? It, it was nice to know that some of it I had taken out because it was originally a thousand words. And I got it down to 650, which or 675, which seemed more palatable. So I'm like, it was good to know that they wanted these things in there. So anyway, but it was a very, very, very lovely holiday book chat with you guys. Thank you so much for taking the time to um, play our little beginning game and just listen and learn with us. And I hope I see a lot of you at Rate Your Story next year. If not, do contact me about how you might um, be able to still be involved in book chat. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays. Bye. Thank you.